It's all about sales, tips and tricks. And today we have Mike Alshler joining us, who his rate is five to ten thousand dollars an hour, but I but he's coming in for free. He has a soft spot for startups. He's done a number of startups himself. He's a serial entrepreneur. I also find it interesting that Michael is a one of the top salespeople in the United States selling photocopiers. And if you go back in the day, if you could sell a photocopier, you could sell just about anything. Isn't that right, Michael? They, they say that. Yeah, I think that is uh, pretty much correct. So it's a good, if anyone sold car, cars or copiers and were very successful, they have the stuff that it takes to be successful pretty much selling anything. So can you start giving us a little bit of your background as to how, you, how it came about and what, and what you're focused on now? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to. First of all, thank you so much. And I know Vlad's not on the call right now, but I, I know I speak for everyone. My heart, I'm sad. I, I'm just... My heart breaks for the people there. I am of Kiev ancestry, so it means something extra special to me. So I know our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to all those folks there. And, and uh, if we can support them in any way, I just want to uh, say that's something I, I plan on doing. I didn't want to do it while I was on the call. I was afraid I would disconnect myself because I'm not good with IT stuff. So I figure I'm here. I'll, I wrote the website down. I'll do it right after the call. But anyway, my, I'm from New Jersey and I was working selling shoes and I was doing great. And that wasn't my life. I was 19 years old. And I said, I want to apply for a real career job. And I wanted, there was this company called Shift Charney in Atlantic City, New Jersey, that was selling satin copiers when, when satin took on Xerox. And I said, I'm going to apply for a job. And I kid you not, this really happened. The night before I was ready to get a call to say whether I got the job or I didn't, my the sales leader, the vice president of sales, his name was Earl Nellius. And I had a dream that night that he called me and said, Mike, it was really close between you and one other person, but you don't have any experience. And we decided to go with the person who had sales experience. And as soon as that dream was up, I kid you not, the phone rang and it was Earl. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what can I help you with? Like, why are you calling back? And he says, Mike, and he went over the same, this never happened to me before or after in my life. He said, Mike, I had a conversation with the president of the company and the other guy was very experienced and you're someone who has no experience. You sold shoes, that's it, no B2B. We decided to go with you. We consider you, I'll never forget his words, a diamond in the rough. And that was my start. And I ended up getting fired from that job because I was always reading and, and, and studying the industry, advancing my skills and my knowledge. And they put me in a branch office at 21 years old and the service man in that office saw that I was calling other companies to find out what they were doing. And he thought I was going to leave. And they set me up and they fired me because they thought I was going to leave the company when that wasn't the case at all. And that was the start of my career. That's when I started the copier company out of my 650 square foot house or apartment, I should say, rather, and grew to a multi-million dollar business in my 20s and sold it to a multi-billion dollar company after that, the Icon Office Solutions. And then moved to Florida, which is what you do when you sell your company in February in New Jersey. Wow. <laughs> so you're telling us, Michael, that you basically worked your way out of a job, extensively fired, and then really worked your way to where you are now in financial independence. So I'm curious for the everyone here in the audience what do we need to do what are the top three tips that you could give us when we're selling to just quite candidly sell a lot and be really successful great question and a uh, tough question because three there's probably more than three but i'm going to tell you a kind of a, a, a life-changing game-changing event for me was uh, a book that i read and first of all if you're not reading books, listening to podcasts, engaging in things like this. I commend everyone. I value your time. And my goal, my commitment to you now is you're going to leave here better than you came in, time well invested that will help you if you're an entrepreneur, a sales leader, or a sales guy like myself and a, and a coach. It's going to leave you with, with some things, some ammunition to be more successful. So that being said, one of the books that really philosophically told me what I needed to know and reverse engineer it was uh, a 60-year-old book at the time. It's probably an 85, 90-year-old book now. Uh, 
and it was called Secrets of Closing Sales by Charles Roth. And the what he said, I've never heard before, or read before in another sales book, and it was people don't buy for only one reason. Only one reason. I'm thinking, come on now. I've heard hundreds of objections. I got to think about it. I still have a few other companies to look at. This is too much money. We know all the objections in our industry. But he said in this book, there's only one reason people don't buy. Everything falls into this category. And that category is uncertainty. They don't buy because they're unsure or uncertain of one or more things. And I said, wow. So what that means is when someone reaches their threshold of certainty, they buy. So the answer, the solution to uncertainty is reassurance. And how do we reassure someone in the areas that they're uncertain about? Testimonials, proof sources, you quantify it, and you first identify it. What are you uncertain about? I can promise you anyone who's a, a, a legitimate prospect, meaning they have the money and the need, there's only one reason they're not buying from you, and that is that they're uncertain of one or more things. Maybe they don't trust you. They're uncertain whether they should trust you or not, whether you're being honest. They're uncertain whether they should buy now or buy later, whether they should wait, whether they should investigate other companies. But if they reach their threshold of certainty, which they will, if you know what they're uncertain about and you continue to share facts, statistics, quantify why they're making the right decision, then they'll buy. So if you go in with that mindset, understanding that will cover everything. The second thing, which- I'll Hey, Michael, just on that note, so you're saying, sell with facts and figures versus moral suasion or sway. I, I, you need, you need both. Cause you know, there, there's, and that's why the three, yeah, you need both. The art of persuasion uh, is important. The reciprocity is important. You give someone something, creating pain is important that you amplify pain. When you go in, you don't solve the problem. You amplify their pain, get them to feel more pain. And then you give them a solution that's going to solve that pain. So there's things that we can go deeper into this, but, at the end of the day, it's going to be a combination of things, but understand fundamentally, people don't buy because they're uncertain and we don't operate in a vacuum. We operate in a competitive environment. We operate in a vacuum that would suck from a one vacuum joke. And the truth of the matter is that if you find out what they're uncertain about and you reassure them, the reassurance is done with facts. That's why when you see an infomercial, 50% of the infomercial are testimonials from people that got the results that you're trying to get. And it shows every cross section of people that you can identify with that got the exact result, solved the problem or helped you achieve something that you wouldn't otherwise been able to solve or achieve without, without using their product or service. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's what, if I understand you, it really is, I think, like you said, it's very multifaceted, but what is the solution? What you're saying makes me think what I always believe is people don't necessarily know that they want something or that they have an issue. So it's creating that solution, whether it's known or unknown. And I think you do that a lot by the confidence and through building that rapport. Yeah, that will take me to the second thing. So you're right with that. People are, you know, prospects are at different levels of some are clear and correct on what their challenge is they're trying to overcome. And they're just trying to identify and be clear on which product or service out there in the marketplace will best solve the problem. So I think you need to replace everyone listening. I, I know I did re replace presenting to positioning. Presenting means you're just presenting your product, how it's going to work and solve the problem. Positioning means how it's going to work better, better than anyone else's faster, bigger, better, more affordable. So you have to, that's positioning your product versus just presenting it. And again, these are fine tuned changes that you make to be more successful when you're going out there. But you mentioned something, I'm gonna tell you a Trump story. Trump, Donald Trump was my largest customer in Atlantic City. All the casinos, Trump Taj Mahal, Trump Plaza, Trump Regency, and Trump Marina were all my clients. I did millions of dollars of business with him 30 years ago, got paid even when he went bankrupt because of the relationships I had. You mentioned relationships. That's the second key thing. So having done all that business with him, one of the things I realized early on that there's a misnomer out there. We all heard, and this is not 100% correct, that people buy from who they know and trust. And that's not entirely true. And I'll tell you why it's not true. 
Because if they know and trust you, and I'm your competitor, and they know and trust me more, I win. So it's not a function of just developing a good rapport, and it's not a function of just building trust. It's you have to build a greater rapport and more trust than anyone you're competing against. And that's a whole system and process. There's a whole set of uh, ways, steps to do that. How do you relate and connect with their passions, not their interests? And that's, like I said, it's a whole nother thing. But the story that I want to share with you, I'm, I'm selling Diane Dixon at Trump Plaza Casino. She buys, she makes a $350,000 purchase of all the copiers for the casino, except the big copiers. The big ones that are selling for the Xerox, what was called a 1090, they're selling back then for $65,000, $75,000. Today, they're probably 100000 She said, Mike, I'll buy these small and mid-sized copiers from you, but I'm never, ever buying the big ones. Xerox owns that market. Xerox is the best. I'll never buy from you. And two years later, all those copiers were replaced, those 1090s, with a product that no one even ever heard of called an OSE, which was made, I think, in the Netherlands. That was around $60,000 also. Now, I got news for you. This, the, the data quest and all this, the stats and statistics, the stats, statistics, fact sheets, I showed them to her and they didn't make any difference. She still said I'm staying with Xerox. But two years later, nothing changed except one thing. And that was my relationship. So the relationship, not only in the beginning of when you're doing business with someone, but ongoingly that you keep, continue to deepen and strengthen that relationship, that will cause, and this is a psychological fact, that will cause a shift in how they see, hear, and internalize your message. Meaning, that's why they say love is blind. The mother never saw their baby and said, oh, my baby is ugly. No, love is blind. The more they love you, the more it's going to amplify the strengths of your product, the benefits of your product. And the more they don't like you, it's going to amplify the and, and have them come up with objections and challenges and see flaws in your product and service. Directly proportionate with how much they like you is the positive spin they'll put on everything and directly proportionate with how much they don't like you or trust you, that negative spin. So it definitely 100% influences the decision that they make. Oh my gosh. So how do we do it, Michael? How do we become more likable? That's, I'm gonna say, particularly challenging right now with COVID and we're not face-to-face -face doing dinners, et cetera. So right. like, how do we do this? Okay, these are the things that, again, First, we're human beings. We're not business people first, we're people first. I remember I gave a big seminar and it was open to different businesses and I showed that I competed against Xerox. And Xerox was a multi-billion dollar company, I was a multi-million dollar company. Their training center, Xerox University, was a hundred times bigger than my main office and warehouse. So I said, how could I compete against them and win consistently and not lower my, didn't win on price. How did I win? How did I continue to win? And I said, they're about products first and people second. And I was about people first and product second. It's the old thing, people don't care how much until they know how much you care. And so the relationships that I developed are what shaped, no, I had to be able to deliver. And I did a lot of what I call ACE, analyze, strategize, and execute. I out prepared myself, over prepared myself. And, and they didn't do that. They thought they could go on their own merits. So there's things, again, that are more detailed than just the relationship. But the relationship was the key factor that got me in the door and kept them buying from me. And Xerox was very weak on the relationship. They were big on business. No one ever has been shot for buying a Xerox. So they had a definitive advantage. They had more resources. They had the reputation, et cetera, et cetera. So the, to answer your question, the specific way to develop a great relationship is to care about the person that you're talking to and deliver value to them first. Don't answer something, give something. And, and it has to be authentic, can, right, Michael? Like it has to be an actual authentic. 100%. It can't be the used car salesperson type of yeah. approach here. Yeah, 100% authentic. You have to give from the heart. People are people first and connect and relate to things that are meaningful to them. If you talk about someone's passions and don't connect on an interest and be superficial, but could, Talk. I was talking to someone today. They have a, a passion called the Umbrella Project that helps disadvantaged families. I deeply care about that. I'm going to connect about that in the beginning of the conversation. Could you tell me about the Umbrella cause? I forget the exact thing, but it was Umbrella caught my attention. 
And this is a call. They're, they're going to talk about it. And it's genuine because that's where our hearts are. And to start a relationship with your heart, it changes everything. But again, to your point, it has to be genuine and real. And it's about connecting on something that they're passionate about and then relating to how you feel about it. And if you don't feel that way, you can use what's, what I call third-party relating. Like I had someone, I had someone a heart, called a hog, a Harley Davidson owner. And they loved Harleys. Now, I can't relate to that. I'm not a Harley guy. Not good or bad. I just don't drive. But my neighbor was. And at 3 in the morning, he'd be washing and waxing his Harley. So I said, you guys are like a brotherhood. So I could relate and understand and connect with him on that because I understood to the best of my ability what that was like. And that really is what accelerates a, a relationship, which accelerates the business. And I'm going to add something else. First. One of the things that we like to do is... I agree with you. Do your research beforehand. There's nothing in my personal experience, and I'm talking about how I feel. If somebody doesn't even know what you do or who you are, that's insulting, okay? And I would say, secondly, go in and listen. Don't just go in and just start preaching, for lack of a better term, but listen to what the person is saying. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, well, it's the old adage, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you'll listen twice as much as you talk. After you connect and relate to what they're passionate about, believe me, you're going to have to jump in sometime and, and tell them, okay, let's uh, move to, I want to respect your time, because they will talk about what they're passionate about until the cows come home. So I, I totally agree. The way you show you're interested in someone is you just don't listen, but you listen with the intent to understand. You lean in, you lean forward. There's little nuances to show that you really, you take notes if it's something that's noteworthy. Those are the ways that you show someone that you're really interested uh, in what they're saying. And that's critical, just if we take it a step further, when you, many salespeople don't take notes. And it's more important or equally important to take notes about their personal life because those are the things that they don't expect you to take notes about. Harvey McKay wrote a book called Swamp the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive. And he talks about the McKay 66, those 66 things that are personal about your client or prospect. I think that's a little overkill, but there's no doubt that if you call up your prospect and say, hey, listen, I just wanted to wish you luck on, on your taking your uh, 215 insurance exam on Wednesday, they're going to say, wow, I can't believe he remembered that or she remembered that. It's all the little things we do that are thoughtful and kind that separate us from everyone else. Very few people do that. And it's a big separator. And, and to do that, to follow up and follow through, again, a big part of being successful in sales. But you want to listen and you want to take notes. Listening is a, a, an active process. And the way you show someone you're listening is by taking notes, by leaning forward, by asking good questions, and by letting them talk. Oh, wow, Michael. Let me just reset the room here for everyone in the room. We are talking with Michael Oshler, the professional expert in sales and coaching, serial entrepreneur. He talked about, so far, already talked about eliminating uncertainty in the sale. That's the number one thing if you focus on that. Through facts and through testimonials, those types of techniques. Building a relationship, listening first, taking notes, understanding personal elements of your client that are thoughtful and kind. These are amazing tips, Michael. You're really hitting it. And if you're in the audience and you have a sales tip or trick, please raise your hand. This is interactive. This is Clubhouse. We want you on stage. If you are also have a startup and you're struggling to make sales, please join us on stage to ask Michael a question or tell us about why you think you're struggling and Michael will give you some advice. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help you come on stage, raise your hand and join in the conversation. Michael, those five or six really key points you've made so far, what else have you got in the bag? This is the biggest one of everything. This is going back to Pareto's 80-20 rule. And, and by the way, Michelle, you said mentioned three things. This would be the third. Pareto's 80-20 rule says on average, we get 80% of our business from 20% of our customers. And in sales, about 80% of the sales are made by 20% of the salespeople. Call it the difference between the world class and the middle class. Whatever you want to put on what that means, the reality is the majority of sales are made by a minority of salespeople. Why is that? 
And here's a bigger question. Why, if they all have access to the same sales training, all have access to the same exact sales training, the same blueprint that will help everyone achieve great success in sales, why do some kill it and the others flounder? And this is the third major point, the most major point in life and in business, and that is that people don't do what they should do, which is an action to achieve what they want in life because of multiple things. Belief system, self-talk, mindset, their comfort zone. The great ones are comfortable being uncomfortable. So they push themselves beyond where they need to push themselves to get and accomplish what they need to get and accomplish. In essence, we're human. We're not human doings, we're human beings. So we have to be more before we do more, before we have more. So the active process of becoming the best version of yourself, constantly improving, reading, listening to audiobooks every day, your habits, rituals, and routines. I coach people one-on-one. And what's amazing to me is the individuals that I typically coach, and I'm not saying this good, bad, or indifferent, make over 300000 a year. The ones that make $100,000 a year think they don't need coaching. But why do the, the folks in sales that are so successful have a coach? Well, because they know that they don't know where their blind spots are. They don't know when their brake light is out. They need someone to hold them accountable, someone to push them beyond where they could push themselves. And these are all things that are drivers in performance. And that's the third thing. It's about peak performance. If you look at pro sports, the goal is to constantly operate at peak levels of performance and keep raising the bar. And consistency, peak performance, consistency, peak performance, consistency, peak performance. How do you stay at that elevated level of performance all the time? when life and business are constantly throwing challenges at you. It's the rejection Olympics out there. If you're an entrepreneur, I've made millions, I've lost millions. How do you continue to be persistent and resilient? These are all behavioral things. And unless you master your emotions, your self-talk, your mindset, all these things are gonna win over you. Two Two forces in the world, the outside forces of the world, getting your attention, focusing you on things you shouldn't be focused on, And what's between your own two ears, your belief systems and what you're saying to yourself. And unless you put things in your path, people and things, because where you stare, you steer. So if you look in my office, you'll see weights, water, Peloton. You'll see all the things that I need to focus on, not things in the outside world that are going to distract me and pull me away from my core focus. So peak performance and behaviors and then drilling down into that are what is going to be the key element between the top 20% and the bottom end. They just do the things. They invest the time to learn the skills. They spend the time to master that. As Tom Hopkins said, they practice, drill, and rehearse it until they don't want to do it anymore, and then they do it some more beyond their comfort zone. They make more calls than anyone, forgetting about that it's a rejection Olympics out there. They're just going all out all the time, hustle and grind, hustle and grind. And it's, that's all behavior. You don't teach that. You do that. And the things that hold you back from that you have to fix. That's your gap. What really resonates with me, and I it totally, to my experience, have found useful too, is that whole point you just made about persistence. And it really is a mind game with yourself. It, it, it becomes very uncomfortable. But if you can really put yourself in a positive state almost, and really just enjoy. It's almost like you have to enjoy the journey. If, if I can say that, it sounds so quaint, but it's true. Then I think it's easier for you to hang in there. And I, I'm curious how you do that. Uh, is it discipline? Is it meditation? What is it that makes a successful person like yourself or the clients you speak about just really hang in there, even if they're getting declined and beat up by everyone all along the way. How, how do we do that? Good, great question. And I, what do we have around two more hours to talk through that? Now, the short answer is the first thing you have to do is be prepared the night before for the next day. And you need to have strong morning, a strong morning routine. When I coach my clients, I said, what do you do first thing in the morning? First thing in the morning you should do is make your bed or pray. I pray first, then I make my bed. 
Okay, so when you do that, that this is a morning routine. This sets you up for success for the day's challenges. Everyone on this call right now has challenges and obstacles and, and roadblocks. We all do. That's welcome to life, right? And, and so the key is if you're not setting yourself up and preparing yourself in the morning and the night before to, to win the battle or put up the good fight, then you're going to be at a deficit all day. To answer your question, it's I wake up. This is my routine. I coach my clients on this. This is based on the, I, I, you always want to hang out with people smarter than you and better than you. That's why I hang out with Colin. And you definitely want to do that. That's where you learn. And he's a, you know, one of the top entrepreneurs I know. And that's where you glean the ideas. Then the next part is, are you putting them into practice? So I hang out with people that are brilliant, that give me ideas. I read, I'm, I'm reading Can't Hurt Me Now by Goggins. Phenomenal. I can go through a wall when I'm done listening to this in the morning as I get ready for my day. So the first thing is you get up early, okay? And then I pray. And then what I do is I make the bed. So first accomplishment done. Then I do, I stretch. Okay. And then after I get done stretching, I go in and uh, get ready, turn on my audible book and start listening to that and, and prepare myself for the day. Then I do some, what's called diaphragmatic breathing through your nose, as deep as you can go, fill your diaphragm up and then breathe out. That's the start. And then I have my gratitude prayers, what I'm grateful for. We're so blessed in this country. And perspective is everything. When you look at what we have compared to anyone else. So perspective is important. And then, then I go in and I make a, I have a list of what are the things I want to attack for the day and get done. Remember, out of sight, out of mind. Insight, in mind. So remember we talked about what we focus on outside world, inside world. Put things in your path, little notes they trigger you and remind you, my wife says you're going to trip over the dumbbells, the weights. And I said, exactly. I want it to be a constant reminder. You need to have that, that, oh, I need to do that. And that, so what motivates me to move through this, I don't feel like doing this. Forget it. Are you kidding me? You think I felt like getting on Peloton this morning? I was beat. I do it because I have a goal. And Simon Sinek would say this, and this is the driver. If you want to know what drives you, why the great ones are comfortable being uncomfortable, and uncomfortable being comfortable, if you want to be the best version of yourself, you're going to have to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to move past the comfort zone into the discomfort zone. And the only way to do that is to have a big why. The bigger your why, the bigger your try. What am I going to get from this? It's going to give me great pleasure or avoid pain. The two drivers, emotional drivers of behavior. And that's, that I'm on a 40 day fast now to get six pack abs at 65 years old, something a little personal. And I want to do this to prove to myself and others that anything can be done if you toughen up, you move through your comfort zone, you have a plan, and you discipline yourself and you just do it even when you don't feel like doing it. My dad used to say, if you don't feel like doing it, chances are it's the right thing to do. And the successful person will do what the unsuccessful person won't do. There's not always going to be pleasure. But of the two emotions, people will do more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. And let that drive you. When you have your why, attach pain to it that will that you'll feel if you don't do it and pleasure if you will. And that's going to be your driver in the moment of decision. I don't feel like doing this and you won't because it's going to be beyond your comfort zone. We have a sympathetic system in our brain that says, no, we don't want to push past pain. It's going to have you stop. It's in our system. So the only thing that's going to push you past that is if you, you win at that game and that's where you have these little tricks or, or tips to, to do that by uh, having a strong why and keeping it in front of you with, pictures or images or notes. Michael, great stuff. And you, you keep mentioning getting outside the comfort zone. And I watched one of your morning huddle videos, and I thought that you gave a tip to the folks in the huddle that I thought was really great. And it really tied into what you're talking about in terms of getting outside your comfort zone. And I'd love for you to elaborate that. And if I remember correctly, what you told people to do was to pick something that you really don't want to do? Like what's on your plate today? What's the one thing on your plate today that you really don't want to do for whatever reason? And then just five, four, three, two, one, do it. In other words, don't yeah. think about it because we talk ourselves out of things. So if you just dive in, so can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I thought that was such a great uh, tip. Yeah, thank you for that. The, the Mel Robbins wrote a great book called The Five Second Rule and really the whole essence, the key takeaway that I have from that book is, and I'll, I'll give you a short story, is the fact that, that 
in the moment of decision, our thoughts are everything. We have 50 to 70,000 thoughts that go through our head every day, 65% of which are negative. The challenge is we're not aware. We're not intentionally aware of what we're thinking of. So our thoughts actually control us. It's been said, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits as they become your destiny, all from your thoughts or things. From your thoughts come emotions, from your thoughts come decisions, actions, or lack of action. And the beauty is we have this dialogue going on in our head all the time. And most of the time we're not aware of it. Now that I mentioned it, I hope everyone will be aware, think about what you're thinking about. And in the moment you could say, I'm gonna change that and have a trigger to change it. The truth of the matter is Mel Robbins' book was great because when you start thinking about it, she like, I don't feel like getting up now. Her philosophy is very simple, psychologically proven, Count down five, four, three, two, one, and go. Five, four, three, two, one, and go. No thinking, no deliberation in your head, no self talk. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And the psychology of that is when a spaceship takes off or a shuttle takes off or anything, or the countdown for New Year's, notice they don't count up, they count down. So we're already conditioned that a countdown is preparing us to do what? To take action. So five, four, three, two, one, take off and just do it. And it gets rid of, so your gut will always tell you the right thing to do. That's why you have the conversation in your head. When it travels from your gut up all the way to your head, I call that the rationalization justification highway. It's no good. So you need to be aware of that. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And then put things in your path that will help you get up and go and, and do that. So an example of that is I'm driving, what's right or wrong, good or bad. Just, we just don't always do it. If you want to be in better shape, stop buying crap and putting it in the refrigerator. Go online. There's 3 million ways to lose weight. Pick one and go. Five, four, three, two, one and go. Why don't we do that if we want to be healthier? We know that we'll be healthier if we lose weight. Why don't we do that? And I'm driving by. It's 8 o'clock at night. I worked a full day selling copiers. And I'm driving down the Black Horse Pike just outside of Atlantic City. And I pass by a one-story building. And it's getting dark out. And I see one light on and one car in the driveway. Now the car, when I noticed it, as I'm driving by at like 40 miles an hour, I noticed the car was not a van because right away I'm calculating, but maybe that's the cleaning people. And it's a car, it's a nice car. So I'm figuring who's working at eight o'clock at night besides me driving home after a long day, 12 hour day, but probably the owner. And I am beat. I worked really hard that day. And I remember as I drive by, it went from my gut. My gut immediately told me, if the owner's there, you get to meet with the owner without having a, a, a secretary or a receptionist, a gatekeeper get in your way. You get to meet right with the owner and have a conversation with him or her, which is all you want in your business. And as soon as my gut told me that, I had started traveling up to the rationalization justification highway into my head. I'm thinking, nah, you know what? You know what? I worked hard today. I'll stop here some other time. We'll be there again. And I start doing that. And then the two things my dad taught me popped into my head. It was like a trigger. He said, the successful person will do what the unsuccessful person won't do. And I knew what the successful person would do. They would stop. And if you don't feel like doing it, chances are it's the right thing to do. And in that moment, I said, dad, oh, and I turned and the wheel screeched and I pulled in the driveway, the parking lot, and I opened the door and out pops his head from one of the office. Who is that? And I said, Mike Altschuler. And it was, his name was Mark Borowski, CRM. I'll never forget, it was over 30 years ago, but it was one of the great sales lessons I've learned and life lessons about moving out of your comfort zone and doing what you know you should do, what your gut tells you you should do. And uh, I stopped there. And the, the reason stopping past five o'clock or calling past five o'clock or on a, a Saturday is so uh, important to success of the true leaders and winners is because when you do that, they see a little bit of themselves in you. That's how they got to the top. They work those hours. So immediately there's a connection there. The second thing was there wasn't the daily interruptions throughout the day that he would he, that Mark would typically have to deal with. So it was uninterrupted time. His tie was slipped down a few notches and it, we were totally, and he saw a little bit of me and him. So it was a, a perfect conversation, ended up being a hundred thousand dollar plus account. We became golf buddies and, but that's all because, and that's the habit you develop that if you don't feel like doing it, you do it. And you do it because that, if you want to be successful and you're driven, that's your why, that's what you're going to have to do. Hey, Michael, one of the things I hate the most is rejection. And yet 
in life as an entrepreneur, as a startup, we get it all the time and we're always selling. If you think about it, even if we're not the salesperson, it seems like we're always selling. How, how, what's the best way to psychologically handle that, the rejection aspect of sales? I'll give you a few techniques that I used and have coached on that I think are successful. We know, and it's a great question, by the way, thank you for asking it. We know that sales is a game of more losses than wins. Just like when you're mining for gold, every shovel full of dirt is getting you one step closer to the gold. And sometimes you'll find the gold, some days you won't. But we know that at the end of the day, if you keep digging and you got the right roadmap, you're gonna hit gold, you're gonna strike gold. And we know that sales is and will always be a numbers game. And rejection doesn't feel good to anybody. I'm a really sensitive person. I don't like to be rejected. I find it difficult sometimes to make calls. You know, why I'm calling, why he doesn't know me, she doesn't know me, I'm interrupting their day. We have all this negative self-talk going in. We know that we're gonna deliver value and we know that they're gonna be better off by speaking to us than not. How you, how I dealt with it was I had a specific goal. This is how many calls I wanna to make today. I still have it on my desk right now. And, and I check it off as throughout the day. So have how many calls and emails you wanna make. That's number one. Number two is the reason you feel insecure or it upsets you when you hear the rejection is because sometimes you think I'm not, prepared enough, or I'm, I'm not going to say the right thing, or I don't know what to say. So there's nothing more important than preparation. Bill Belichick in his uh, locker room, arguably the greatest coach of all time, has one rule, one quote in his locker room of the millions of quotes that are out there that he lives by and his players live by. And that's why they have become a dynasty. And that is from the art of war, Sun Tzu, every battle is won before it's ever fought. So if you want to be more comfortable and not feel the rejection as much as you do, then be better prepared. And I mean better prepared with your performance, meaning the habits, rituals, routines, your mindset, read, do all the things to get better, knowing your product, your competition, knowing your script, what you're gonna say, not to be sound scripted, but know your value proposition, your elevator pitch. What are you gonna say when you call the person up on the phone? The more prepared you are, the more uh, you're gonna be comfortable making those calls. And as you get rejected throughout the day, know that you're getting one step closer to the goal. Know that it, that every call has a value, an actual dollar value. So if you take, for example, if you do a hundred, make a hundred calls and on the hundredth call, you make a sale and you make that sale for a thousand dollars, every call was worth what? $10. You would have never got to the hundredth call that was a sale had you not made all those calls. Every call has a value. Just divide it by what you make at the end of the week, month, or year, and you'll know that you only got there because of the calls that you made. So every call has a value. And the last thing I would say to this point, how do you deal with the rejection, is no, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting your offer. And it's, it may be no now, but maybe yes later. And, and there, there is one more thing that, that I think is critical. Because we're in a game of more no's than yeses, it's critical that you celebrate the yeses. And what I mean by that, if you make an appointment Celebrate it. In that moment, give yourself a fist pump. Yeah, I got that appointment. I made the, when you make a call that you don't feel like making, do a fist pump. Say, yeah, I did it. I did something I didn't feel like doing. You see, what happens is that charges your battery. And an interesting analogy, if you watch an NFL football game, they don't celebrate the victory at the end of the game unless it's a last minute score. They celebrate every successful play during the game because they know if they have successful plays during the game, then they'll be successful at the end of the game. And notice they don't celebrate alone. The whole team celebrates, because what does that do? It elevates everyone's level of performance. It fills everyone's battery. And that's what you have to do. Remember, this is a team sport. Even if you're working alone, surround yourself with people that encourage you, battery chargers, not battery trainers. And those are gonna be the things that keep you moving through the rejection that sales is so notorious for. I love that. For me, I have a little motto that I go through in my brain. If somebody says no, or they don't want to listen, I just think no for now. And let's talk in six months or, or whatever it is, because I completely agree with you. It, it's not about you. No, it's not. It's not. And it's easy to make it feel about you. I'm inadequate. I'm not good enough at what I do. 
but understand they if, if it was if they said yes to everyone then and it, it, it wouldn't be sales so the reality is you're right it's, it's you, just, you just keep going but it's critical i can't tell you enough because life and business are draining yeah i'm telling you we all know that it's draining and there's more negatives sometimes than positives so you have to celebrate even for a moment the smallest of accomplishments let that charge your battery a little bit because you'll need that reserve when you're having a tough day well this is great if we have any last questions from the audience please raise your hand now or if you want to share a sales tip or if you have a, a, a challenge in your business with respect to sales please raise your hand now we've only got about nine minutes left Michael, one of the biggest things I've learned in sales when we ran our companies was the daily sales huddle. I think, Jeff, you referred to something that uh, Michael was doing as, as well around that. It really changed our organization. Once we implemented, we saw huge results. We fired a number of salespeople. We added salespeople. You knew right away who was performing. And there were three questions that we asked on every sales huddle in the morning. And there were very short meetings. We invited all the executives to them. And the three questions were, what was your top victory yesterday what is your number one focus for today and are you stuck and i have to say the number one question that made a difference was what was your top victory yesterday and it even made a difference with myself when i showed up to the meeting i had to have something in my hand i had to say oh i called the ceo of something like it motivated me because i didn't want to be embarrassed by my peers have you had success with sales daily sales huddles and if so, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Great point, uh, Colin. The, the sales huddles are great because, like you said, with accountability, that's critical. And you really want to have everyone talk about their wins, their losses, and their challenges. And everyone has them. But making everyone speak up or having everyone speak up is going to be critical to hold everyone accountable to achieving the level of success that, that hopefully uh, they're there to achieve. But the huddles... Are I conduct huddles three times a week for my clients, 15 minutes each huddle. So not just an hour meeting on a, a Monday, because by Tuesday afternoon, after they've been hit over the head a uh, hundred times, that's gone, long gone. So it's a little jolt in the morning, focusing on a key performance tip or trick or technique that will get them elevated, get them ready for the day and prepared to fight a good battle and win a lot of battles. But the victory, I'll ask you a question. Anyone in the audience can jump in and answer this question. Here's what was posed to me, and I answered it wrong, by the way. If you, this is anyone in sales, if you had an easy sales call to make first thing in the morning or a challenging one to make first thing in the morning, which one would you call first? The most challenging sales call or the easiest sales call? Call Jeff? Jeff? What do you think? (laughs) Jeff, you can start, Jeff. (laughs) You read my mind. You're supposed to choose the harder one, but most of us will choose the easier one. Is it, I'm afraid of rejection, so I'll do the easy one first. But there's a, you know, there's, okay. there's a saying, actually, it's funny, Michael, because I actually I have a chapter in my book about it, and it, it's about start your day by eating a frog, which is a saying that's often uh, attributed to Mark Twain. Right. He said that you should eat a frog first thing in the morning when you wake up, because after doing that, nothing else you face during the day is going to be as bad as swallowing that frog. That's um, correct. That's and when what we, I heard. Yeah. And when I was in the film industry making independent uh, action horror films, we used to try to do a stunt, a very complicated stunt on the first day of filming for that very reason. That was our equivalent of eating the frog, because if you start out on day one, first day of filming, let's do a complicated stunt. Let's blow up a building. Let's flip a car. It causes everyone in the team to be very focused. You have to pay attention. You'll see right on day one who your stars are and who are the people who are the weak links, because everyone's got to be on their best performance when you're doing this complicated stunt. So I think what you're recommending is that we should start each day by eating a frog or doing a stunt? I'm gonna floor you and tell you the opposite is true, but I read and believed everything you said, Jeff. That was Jeff speaking, right? Yes. Yeah, I I thought, yeah, of course. So I absolutely believe that. I answered the same way you answered. And current and the most, and they've done studies on this, that it would have you make your easiest sales call. And you start with small, successes and let them build to build your confidence to take on the more difficult tasks. And when you look at the psychology of this, 
We've all heard success begets success and failure begets failure. Look at your own day. If you have a day that's been tough and things aren't going right, you have no confidence, no mojo, no energy to call your toughest client. But if you have a day that everything's going great, give me that toughest client. Come on, I can't wait to call him or her. In the book by James Clear, a phenomenal book called Atomic Habits, and also BJ Fogg, who's a, he has a room here on Clubhouse as well. He's a professor and just an expert on habits and all the current thinking, which is, like I said, proven out in studies, is that we want to grow 1%. If we get 1% better every day, we're 37 times better at the end of the year. So it's about micro changes, little improvements, little successes that build to big successes, little movement forward. They say inch by inch, anything's a cinch, yard by yard, anything's hard. So the, the book, and I forget which one I read, that says the first thing you do is you make your bed, okay? And that's the first accomplishment. And it seems meaningless, but it's significant because then you go on to the next something. And, and like I said, you build confidence and confidence begets confidence and success begets success. And then you take on the tougher t task or challenge and you're more equipped to deal with it with the energy and the confidence from the smaller successes that you had. Wow, Michael, what an hour. And I'm glad we, after we had the technical problems earlier on, that we tried to, to make this session happen because there were at least 10 good tips. And I, I can't wait to read the blog, Michelle, that the team's going to put together and repost this and, and go back and listen to all of those tips or even just read about them. And if you're listening to the podcast right now, check out www.startup.club. If you want to check out that blog, we have Mike Alden in the audience. I'm just going to pull you up, Mike. If you just want to talk to you there for a second, Mike is coming with, Hey Mike. Hey there. Hey, Mike is coming to us next week, I believe to talk about how entrepreneurs and how startups need to create a brand for themselves. Jeff, you're going to love that topic. I know you're, you're great at it as well. And, uh, Mike, any thoughts on that topic before we close out well, here? You know, Mike, uh, I, love, I, do, I, do I want to say first, I love Mike. I love Mike Alden. He's the best. Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, I did just come here late. I apologize. And I'm looking at I'm looking at the stage, and I see green, and I don't see Michael with the coveted moderator badge. Did he do something wrong? Did he screw something up in the beginning? Was he the one that screwed up the room in the beginning? No, we don't know what happened. It looked like it could have been a hack. Uh, it could it have been a technical problem. Who knows what it is, Mike? He's a Mike. very sensitive but, guy, and as you guys could probably tell. So, you know, exactly. Sure. <laughs> so just in 30 week. seconds, Mike, talk about next week. Yeah, I was talking to Mike, and, and Mike and Mike was telling me he was doing this room, and I was like, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure that uh, you introduced me to Colin. Yeah, I'm excited for next week to talk a little bit about branding from a of, of book. I mean, the I was just on with somebody, I was speaking to him for over an hour about his brand, how to properly put it together, and then also use that book as a stepping stone for whatever business you want to build. So many businesses are built off of just that one book or that one story, but I think one of the critical mistakes, and we'll talk about it next week, is we, we're so excited about telling our story because we think our story is special and unique, and a lot of people really are. Think about, because I didn't think about this, we'll talk about it next week, we don't think about what do we need to do? What sort of plans do we need to put in place in order to properly monetize this book? All the blood, sweat, and tears and all of our trials and tribulations and all the things that we've gone through throughout our lives. And we want to share those experiences and then help others. But, in, in, but really, truly, if you're going to do all this stuff, you need to say to yourself, how can I continue to build upon these stories and the things that I've gone through and help other people while helping myself? So we'll talk about that next week. I'm excited for having me. Thank you so much. And, um, and again, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, big fan of Michael Oshler. This guy, he we met years ago and he I talk to him at least once a week. If I don't talk to him, I feel like I'm getting behind because his experiences uh, are so vast and his knowledge has been just really instrumental to me. And because I'm friends with him, he doesn't charge me. I really appreciate him and thanks for, for allowing me to speak. I know all of us here in the room, in the replay or in the podcast, really appreciate your time, Michael Oshler and Mike Alden next week. We're looking forward to hearing that. You may see there's a link on the above here, givesendgo.com slash for Ukraine. The company that I work with and started with my business partners 20 years ago has is located in Nikolaev, Ukraine. And in the last hour, I've seen four or five messages saying that we're the city's under attack right now. It is the next city after Kherson that, that may fall. But I tell you this, they're putting up a really good fight. Uh, I've got heard a, a lot of stories on the ground how we've 
captured Russian soldiers and, and things like that. Now, that being said, we can sit and watch it or we can donate. And we had three donors in the last uh, 45 minutes. That's great. Really appreciate that. If you just click on the link, $10, $20, $30, we have the infrastructure to get the money deployed instantly on the ground. This company, Geeks for Less, has already donated $1 million to the local hospital. A lot of this money or the majority of this money will be used for the hospital in Mykolaiv, Ukraine. And we need your help. This is a desperate time. These are desperate people. And we are looking at helping them the best way we can. And with your help, it does make a difference. Thank you very much for listening to the show. Any final thoughts, Michael Osler? Just prayers go out to everyone in the Ukraine. I, I ask everyone more important than sales is our fellow human beings. We can support them in any way we can with prayers and with our, fun, our funds, our money. So thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention, Colin, and for all that you do. And thank you everyone for investing your time here and Colin for having me on the it's great. Room. We just got another $100 just came in right now. That's awesome. Really appreciate it. Anything you can do, check it out. GiveSendGo.com slash for Ukraine. Thank you. Perfect. Bye for today. Bye-bye.